Okay. All right, go ahead. The webinar has started. Great. Um, so I will officially open the meeting of the Board of Health on November 14th. And I just need to say all of the participants, you don't need to say here. Um, so myself, Risha Hess, Daya, Betsy, and Jack are all present. Um, and we're joined by Kiko. And I think that's all we need to say. Great. Um, shall we start with some introductions of both Daya and Mahin, who has now joined us? Sure, so welcome, sure. Daya. Welcome, Daya Mena, our newest board member. Would you like to just introduce yourself, say a few words? Sure. Um, thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, my name is Daya Mena. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm thrilled to be on the local board of health for the town of Amherst. Thank you. Great. Happy to have you. And then I also wanted to introduce uh, Mahin Ahmed, who I just promoted into the meeting. So welcome, Mahin. Uh, this is, you today is your second day on the job. Yes. <laughs> and we're really happy to have her. Um, she's joining from home today and will, um, you know, she didn't help to set up the meeting. I did all of that because she just started on mm -hmm. Tuesday. Um, but um, in the future, she'll be doing all that work and then joining the meeting like Kyle used to. So she's really taking on Kyle's responsibilities. Really happy to have you on board. Thank you. I'm excited to work with you guys in the future. Yeah, welcome. 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 Thank you. And Daya, we're really excited to have you join us as well. Thank you. Um. So the first item on the agenda is reviewing the minutes from last month. Um, does anyone have any concerns, edits, comments, questions? I did not notice any, but. I have one thing that I, I, I neglected to notice when I was reviewing them before sending them out to you, which is to make a change under the introduction of board and staff members, um, that it should really read Diamena is a new member, but due to a scheduling conflict, will not be present for this meeting. Uh, it, right now it reads timing problem. So we wanna make that change. Okay. I should have caught that, so. Great, and so none of us are actually taking the minute. So mm -hmm. we will just note that that is to be changed when the minutes are taken. Yeah. Any other, Betsy? I I can't tell if you're on mute or. I'm fine. Okay. Um, any other catches or edits or comments? If not, can we have someone uh, move to approve and then we'll need a second. So moved. I move to approve the minutes. I'll second. Great. And then. Um, I think I need to go around, so, which, uh, so Betsy, yay or nay? Yay. Jack? Yes. Daya? Yay. And me, yay. All right, so the minutes are approved. Um, and now is the time for public comment. I don't see anyone in the waiting room. And Kiko, did you receive any public comments to read or any? I did not. Okay. Well, then that's a quick item. Um, and then we have two old business items. Uh, first is the body art regulation, and the second is the tobacco regulation. Um, I'm tempted to switch the order of those because the tobacco is much quicker. Um, it's just an update of um, what the next steps are. So we have uh, gotten through a lot. Um, Many of you were not here for the whole process, uh, so you don't quite know how relieved we are to get to this point, but it, it we're happy to. Um, and so I think we have, based on the last meeting, we have a final draft that then needs to go to public comment. Um, so Kiko, do you want to walk us through, is it just a matter of scheduling? Yeah, so once, um, I think once we have the final, final, you know, with all of the results of the discussion that we had last time into the document, 
um, then we will find it. We need to do it, find a date. Usually what we've done is we've had it before the board meeting. So maybe start early or start it at five and then have the board meeting begin at 530. Usually the public hearing doesn't take that long. Um, that's what we did um, with the body arts regulations. Hard to know whether there will be a lot of interest in this, um, but we can adjust the timing accordingly. So I guess the proposal we would make is to choose the date of the next board meeting just to make the best use of everyone's time, hold the public hearing beforehand. We do need to advertise it in the newspaper, so we have to have adequate time to do that. Um, but we can certainly there's plenty of time before the next meeting to make that happen. And I have a feeling the next meeting may be an in-person one. Does that factor in at all? Um, so again, I have not, I've only experienced one public hearing. It was at the beginning of my tenure. It was virtual. Um, I think we can do an in-person meeting and we can have the public hearing in person as well. We'll just choose a venue that will allow people to come and make their comments about this um, in person. So we can certainly do that. Okay. And I sent you the final draft. Did you receive that? Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Did, was was like that today? No, it was like a week or so ago. So I can resend. Thank you. I, there have been a little few glitches with the email, things not getting through. So I appreciate you resending. Yep. Okay. So Great. yeah, go, you're as soon as um, I probably won't send it tonight, but uh, you'll get it tomorrow, and then you can you can schedule. Does anyone have? Um, a preference for starting early versus ending late. So we could start at, you know, say four or four thirty, and then start our meeting on the normal time of five, or we could start everything at five and bump us back, expecting to to end by eight. Which day are we talking about? Uh, the twelfth of December. I have a slight preference to start early rather than <clears throat> finishing later. Any others? Um, and can I ask about that? I, I was getting confused about the date that we're choosing for the board meeting. That The 12th is the second Thursday of the month. And Jack, I think you're the one who has the main conflicts on Thursday. Yeah, I see. I have a, I have a meeting. I, I think it's confirmed, but at... 5.30 with the PVC, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, again, I'd, I'm i willing to, to skip that if, if need be, but. So we could move it the week earlier or the week after, theoretically. Yeah, and the week after, I have another meeting then on Thursday. Sorry, my Thursdays are at five or messed up for the yeah <laughs> but so i mean this isn't specifically on the agenda but it is something that we need to talk about today because i think we we left it at the end of last meeting that we would have this meeting today but we still needed to in light of your schedule find a regular recurring meeting that most board members can attend most of the time and it seems like second and third thursdays aren't great for you jack so anyway risha i don't know if you want to do this now well, but we definitely need to do it at some point tonight yeah, let's, we're starting it. Let's do it. Okay. S slight preference from four to six rather than five to seven. It, at, for the regular meeting. For the regular. Okay. But um, I'm retired, so, you know, that's easy for me to say. I think that probably won't work for Premila because she does work until she works in a clinic. And um, I think that it used to be that 530 was the earliest she could come, but now she said it was five, but I think earlier than that probably won't work for her. Okay. Would the first Thursday of the month be a, a slot that everyone could do? Yeah, uh, I it looks like Every every three months, I have something on the second Thursday, and every month on the fourth Thursday. Um, so then, either the third or the first is the. That's the way it looks. Yeah. Okay. So the third Thursday is open for you, Jack. 
So say January 16th, February 20th. I'm just being clear. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, the, these calendars, I'm just looking at old appointments because the, the appointments for 2025, uh, or excuse me, the schedule hasn't been rolled out yet. I'm just going by what has happened this past year. Um, and, and it appears like, yeah, I'm not, I'm wondering why the, the third Thursday didn't, hasn't come up as an option, but. No, that was because of me or <laughs> is that something you could confirm via email? Yes. All right. So for for December, does the fifth work for everybody? I think yes. the only problem with that is it's a little bit tight in terms of having to advertise the public hearing with enough time. Because yeah, how much time is needed? Yeah, um, it's really it's I guess it's three weeks away from today, um, right? Am I counting my weeks properly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe that that's okay. We could probably make that work if we want to stick with the first. Okay. If not, maybe we just delay the the hearing because December just gets. I know. Sticky quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does feel like maybe we should do the first. Um, we'll make try to make it work. We can change it if we have to, if it doesn't work for this public hearing. And then maybe stick with the first Thursday because it seems like that's free and clear for you, Jack, right? No conflicts or for anybody yeah, else. I've, um, yeah, I'm just checking, uh, you know, this past year. And yeah, it's always been it's always been clear. But I thought we talked about these other dates, but I guess not. We had decided that we would set a December uh, November date and then talk. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. tentatively the first, we obviously need to check with Premila, um, and maybe we just send a note to everybody asking that they can confirm that that's. Generally, I mean, we're always going to have exceptions, but generally a good time for people. Just just saying January 2nd is a milestone day, for, um, a milestone round number birthday for me. So that's not going to work for me. <laughs> that, that January will be tough because it is still school break and it's yeah. you know, the day after New Year's. So we may have to make another move on that one, but... We're not invited. Is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> you're invited, but you can't uh, <laughs> business. Can't talk anything about <laughs> wells or tobacco <laughs> or restaurants that be open. <laughs> they will not cater the event. <laughs> All right. Uh. So that is all on tobacco. We actually don't have a discussion at per se. It was just sort of letting you guys know the, the next steps. I think that we should be prepared um, that there are groups that want to uh, make comments. Um, tobacco tent, you know, there's, there's retailers who have a, a stake in tobacco sales. And so I would be surprised if no one showed up. Um, and I think, is it usually an hour? Is that? What yeah, I mean, I think last time we scheduled half an hour and we didn't need that much time because okay, there was just one like person, you know, there's only one body art establishment right. in town. So it all depends on how many people come. You have to sort of let people say their piece and then move on. So I think an hour is probably about right for this. Okay, and I will look to see maybe, in, assuming Kiko, you don't know off the top of your head, if there's some guidance uh, on running these public comments, because I think generally it is just a listening forum for us. It's not a debate. Um, yeah, we do have those documents on how to hold a public hearing. I think there's even a webinar that we can log on to to prepare ourselves for. Uh, Risha, I could share that with you. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, we can talk more about that. Okay. So um, our meteor issue is with the, the body art regulations. So this is something that um, is a 
a relatively new regulation. It was the first thing sort of that passed when Kiko and I joined just over a year ago. So neither of us was part of formulating them, but we were here when they passed. It's the only public comment uh, session that we've been part of. And um, the a month or two ago, someone applied for the first time since those new regulations have been passed uh, to get a license to be a piercer in town. And we found some obstacles. Um, the, I don't know, Kiko, do you want to... Do you want me to give a summary of what's been raised? Do you want to give a summary? No, you you go ahead. You've been well briefed because I missed most of that meeting. So I think you can do it. Go ahead. Okay. So the, the first issue that came up is that there is um, a requirement to get the license that you need to have passed a anatomy and physiology course um, for piercers as such. And... Um, Turns out <laughs> there's not really any anatomy and physiology courses for piercers. Um, so the the obvious um, options at this point are there. Um, so the first thing I did was say, where did this come from and, and how did we put it in our regulations? Um, and it turns out that it is in the state template. Um, so there is a template that is advised, you know, that you build off of when the local boards pass new regulations and, and it's in there. It looks like um, it may have been Quincy that was the first uh, board to pass this and they had uh, a list of where you could take that course. The One of them was the uh, Professional Society for Piercers, which is a national society based in California. Uh, they used to run uh, in-person courses in California. So you'd have to fly to California. It was like $850 for the course. And you could take this course. They no longer offer it. So that's off the table. Um, there is a group from um, New Hampshire. I think I have it written down somewhere, but see, don't know how good my notes are. Um, and they, um, they do, as part of their larger piercing courses, they have a session on anatomy and physiology for piercers. So you, again, it's an in-person, you go to New Hampshire, you join whenever their next scheduled course is. Um, and it's specifically for Massachusetts piercers, because we're the only state that has started to pass these rules that you need this course. There is also an online version um, for UK piercers. Uh, oh, so the course in New Hampshire is about $350. There's an online version from the UK that's about 25 pounds, um, so much, much cheaper um, and uh, seems to be a great information course. The last session, of course, is regulations in the UK, which is completely unapplicable for us and unfortunately does not have any regulations for the US or Massachusetts. Um, and so it led us down this rabbit hole of we have, oh, and then there's the community college or college courses. So you could take anatomy and physiology one and two at a community college or college level. Um, obviously, that is a long time period for, you know, a, se a semester or two. Um, and um, quite expensive if you're not doing this as part of a course. Turns out there's huge waiting lists. So you'd be on a wait list at GCC for over a year. And you probably wouldn't get in if you weren't already taking all the prereqs and uh, like a medicine or biology major. So it seems that we have created a course, uh, a, a, a um, requirement. <laughs> yeah, that is is fairly impossible to meet. Um, there is one right now way to meet it um, in New Hampshire, but it took me quite a long time to even find that. Um, so. It's not even clear. Um, so we need to, uh, Kiko worked with the um, the licensing folks and for this particular person said, we're gonna waive it. Um, you have previous, you have a skin course for tattoo artists. We're just gonna say that works for you for now so that we can then revisit this larger topic. I'm going to keep going. There, there is a discussion to be had there, but there's some other issues with uh, the regulations that I don't want to miss out on. Um, 
The second is the issue of apprenticeship. And I'm sort of going in order of um, urgency. So we uh, licenses to be piercers and tattoo artists are annual licenses and they need to be in by the 1st of December. So we are about to get all of our licenses renewed. Now, there we have one tattoo and piercing shop operating in the town and I think there's three piercers. Um, so it's not a huge number, but we have three people who are about to renew licenses that we need to make sure they can. So the first one is that requirement and we need to figure out what to do immediately in the short term and then longer term on that. The second that does not need to be finished by December 1st, but is is pending, uh, could come up at any point is uh, the issue of apprenticeship. The way our regulations are written, um, they say you need blah, 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 blah. They have like a bulleted list of all the things that need to be covered in the apprenticeship. It includes things like uh, needles, pigments, machine, construction, adjustment, power supply. It turns out nobody knows what those things mean. Um, what does a machine mean? What what machine? Um, what does it require? How, how do you prove that you've covered machine in your apprenticeship? Uh, what would the documentation look like for that? Um, so there's hours, there's a minimum of hours, which are Nobody can quite figure out how those numbers came up because it's 2020. It's not a, if you break it down by weeks, it doesn't, it doesn't quite figure out. So like, where did we get these numbers? And they say it's a year full-time equivalent, for instance, for a body piercer, but that's not 2020 hours, which is what's listed in that paragraph. Um, so, but that aside, how do they prove hours? Time stub? Like time you know, what if, are, are they paid? Is it a timesheet? Is it how? So we've sort of set up these regulations without really thinking through what the paperwork would look like and how to give inspectors guidance on, did they meet that uh, or not? Um, it is not clear from our regulations at what point an apprentice can do procedures on a human. Um, so there isn't guidance there, you know, after X hours, they can do things under supervision of a licensed tattoo artist or piercer, um, or after the whole apprenticeship is finished, only then can you. And so again, from, from an inspector standpoint, if they go in and they see an apprentice piercing, is that okay? Uh, it's not clear in our regulations. Um, I think the third I issue is around guest artists. Um, so guest artists are people who can come in for 30 days. It can be uh, renewed three times. So for a total of 90 days, it can be renewed twice. Um, and they are not licensed in the town, um, but sort of oddly, they don't have the same requirements as the licensing for uh, folks who work full time here. And, um, you know, other states have very different requirements for licenses. So it's not that another state, you know, would, would just, we'd look at that and be like, oh, sure. Uh, there's also questions around whether that guest artist needs to be supervised. Um, it looks like the, um, the license holder in, in Amherst would then um, be in charge of that guest artist, but it's not clear sort of does that that supervision need to happen? Um, I think that there is an issue here of higher risk for guest artists because presumably you would not come into town unless you had a list of people who were wanted, so this is tattoos, um, to, uh, to be tattooed. And so you're gonna have a higher number of people in any given time being tattooed. And so um, we should probably have some clarity around that. There is a question of, um, on the form, we, they are supposed to give their social security number and these forms become public record. Um, so that's not great. Um, we don't wanna be putting people's social security number on public records. Um, and then the last thing I would say is there's some um, anatomic incorrectness. I don't know that that's the right uh, sentence, but um, there's use, so we, we ban types of piercings 
Um, it, the types of piercings we ban comes from a 2002 uh, update. It, it, it was not something that was updated in this last round. Uh, they seem fairly curmudgeonly <laughs> um, over restrictive on what can be pierced and they are not using clear anatomical terms that make it um, uh, very clear what we're banning and what's not banned. So it looks like we need to relook at these regulations. Um, I'm really happy that our uh, inspectors have taken a, a deep look into this. I think it also gives us really good guidance for things like the tobacco regulations and making sure we've thought through the, um, and, and I've, su I've suggested that during the open comment period is when the inspector should take a look at this with an eye to how would you enforce this and are there gaps in our clarity. Um, so, I don't think that we should or can discuss and decide here everything beyond um, this course on anatomy and physiology. And I'm going to suggest that we make a decision for this coming year. So the renewals that are going to happen on December 1st, that will be good for a year. Uh, just so you know, we absolutely could say it's good for a shorter time. We could say that um, we will license you without this course for three months, we will not charge you to renew the license, but we will, you know, require you to get something in the future, or we may require you to get something in the future. Um, my preference, I think, would be to come up with something that we feel good about for the year and not make it overly complicated for folks, um, but I can be convinced otherwise. So I don't know if I've asked a clear question, but any, any thoughts on this course on anatomy and physiology for piercers. Amend it, get rid of it, uh, provide clarity on what, what it is, what, what counts. Betsy, you had some, some good questions when yeah. I used this to you around the purpose of it. Right. Yeah. I, um, as, a, as a physician who's taken courses on anatomy and physiology, None of that would have been what it, none of the anatomy and physiology courses that I took uh, would have helped me to become a better piercer. Um, so I, I, I ended up feeling, you know, as you did, that there has to be a very concrete, specific uh, way of meeting the requirement that seems reasonable. And I think semesters of general anatomy and physiology courses at junior colleges it's, it just doesn't seem like a reasonable uh, way of meeting the requirement. So absent that, um, you know, that requirement just doesn't make sen sense to me. I, I just wonder how it's done elsewhere, because I think um, I was thinking about the, you know, with different kinds of um, services like piercing, I don't know whether you would call doing uh, hair perms or uh, shaves, you know, what's it, what's a similar kind of thing where there's some knowledge of hygiene uh, or other practices? How, how is that, how is that body of knowledge usually uh, specified in public health regulations? I, I'm a newbie, I, I don't know, but strikes me if somebody has made this a requirement, um, is there a structure, is there a usual way that's done? I can't speak outside of the piercing. I, I dove deep into the piercing uh, for this, but I, I don't know anything outside the piercing world um, in terms of how, how they've thought of it. I can give you um, the two that I think are most relevant is that UK online one and the New Hampshire in-person one. Um, the outline of the course on the New Hampshire one, they're both eight, eight to 10 hours uh, of, of work. The outline is an overview of the nervous system and with an emphasis on facial nerves, an overview of male and female genitalia, the skin and healing. Oh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce some of these words. The in integument, shin healing and repair, that probably meant should be skin healing and repair. Integument is 
possible maybe it's about belly button. Is that relevant to belly button piercing? Yeah, so integument is like uh, guts, in, uh, intestines. Okay, so, it, and then in parentheses, that one has different types of skin trauma or injury. The lymphatic system, lymphedema, why piercing openings cannot be restricted, hypertrophic scarring, uh, fle oh gosh, follicular <laughs> cyst, the body's mm -hmm. response to injury, fever, complications of inflammation, and contact dermatitis. That uh, sounds like an actually very relevant list. I, I like that yeah. list. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think somebody doing this should know those things. And so, so then the, the crux of it is that we have created a monopoly for this one New Hampshire core. <laughs> And the whole state has, right? I mean, any any yeah. town who has passed regulations in the past four years or so has this in their regulations in Massachusetts. Can we ask the person who wrote the regulations or the department that wrote the regulations what they had in mind? Kiko, were you able to track anyone down? I wasn't able to track anyone down. So Risha had the same suggestion that we um, contact the state to find out why, first of all, why they may have put this in the template to begin with. Was there something that happened? Was there a lawsuit? Was there an accident because a piercer didn't have the correct training? So that kind of background would be helpful. And then if Northampton is using this template, how are they ensuring that people meet this requirement? I don't think we had a chance to reach out to Northampton to ask those kinds. We often ask surrounding towns how they're managing these things it's helpful to us so right because it does seem like it reinventing the wheel is not that that's amazing the amount of work that Rish has put into this but it it does seem that when these regulations come out yeah i did talk to the doesn't. guy in new hampshire because i wanted to make sure his course was actually available it's not clear how you would sign up online um and he expressed a deep frustration that everyone was requiring it without having any clarity on what it was mm -hmm. um, and that there was just a lot of room for for sort of checking boxes and not actually ensuring safety mm -hmm. um, he was very very interested in talking to us and talking to other boards and really wanted to get this i think he uh he was part of the quincy group that uh, may have started it and then he got frustrated with the massachusetts legal policies on this and went to New Hampshire. Um, so my my sense uh, from the research I've done without being able to talk to anyone at other health departments or the state is that uh, no one's figured out how to enforce this and they sort of ignore it. Um, because just because the, you know, if I look at what it says, it counts, those things don't exist anymore. So obviously nobody's updating them. Nobody's um, and they haven't existed for a long time. Yeah, I, um, I'm i interested to uh, know who the person in New Hampshire is. I just came across this site that says Save Each Life, that um, the person who runs it is based in Greenfield, but it's purely online. Um, I'm not sure if the person you spoke to was Dan Oros at all. No, I, now I have to find my notes. Rich Warner of Primal Instinct. Okay, it looks like it could be interesting. Um, it looks like it can be an inter a different route potentially. Um, it's called SaveEachLife.com, um, and it's specifically for tattoo and, and body piercing practitioners. I think to the question, um, I agree that um, with Betsy that I think it would be important to have some sort of training on the the body to be able to to then manipulate things like piercings. Um, I do worry that if we um, continue to have situations where, I know we only have one uh, place in town right now, but if we had continue to have situations where piercers, uh, where Kiko has to review each individual uh, and their history, that it, it might put a burden, undue burden on, on the public health department. I'm also hesitant to completely take it away, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have an option to grandfather in, um, the the existing piercers and say that we accept their past experience as because uh, the the actual part of this regulation that we've passed does say or experience and whatever as uh, deemed acceptable by the board. 
training and ex uh, possess a combination of training and experience deemed acceptable to the board. Um, so we do have that option. Um, and I, I have to admit, I'm leaning towards it uh, as a way of getting through the next few weeks, because I don't think we're going to, um, you know, be able to have a, a clear mandate in the next few weeks. On the other hand, I too am, am not leaning towards getting rid of it permanently and, and would rather figure out what what the requirements really are, what others are doing, and um, see if we can draft something better or at least a list of places that we would deem acceptable. Um, it does mean we have to update it as clearly other municipalities have. Mm -hmm. it's I, to say, I got that wrong about integument. It, it actually <laughs> is basically skin. It's the opposite of what I said. Body's outermost layer, skin, hair, nails, glands, nerves. So... But it, it, it still seems a very, um, I, I like your compromise of, of um, grandfathering and people who've been doing this for a long time, but then taking the time to, to look and see how to make these regulations uh, reasonable to implement before making any changes in them. And so the option for now would be grandfathering in those already licensed in Amherst that they don't have to do additional coursework to that we would deem their experience in Amherst as passing this course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other suggestions or and then we table it and keep doing research and bring it back into the next meeting. Um, and and maybe further discuss these other points that I also raised. I, I think, you know, what I don't want to do is create regulations that mean people are, are you know, going to go to Northampton only because they're not enforcing them or make us super difficult. On the other hand, I, I too like the outline and think that it um, seems like things I'd want my piercer to have been trained in. All right. Um, so can I get a motion uh, to grandfather in piercers who are currently licensed in Amherst um, to the requirement of anatomy and physiology for piercers for one year? Um, hey, I'm moved. Yep. I think I should take out that for one year. If you're grandfathering them, you can grandfather. grandfather them permanently. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to state it again? <laughs> Let me try again. Mm -hmm. uh, to grandfather in any currently licensed piercers in Amherst um, that their experience and training meets the requirements of the anatomy and physiology course. So moved. As so moved. Do you need to say that it meets that requirement or just say that they um that they that their license um is grandfathered so you haven't commented one way or another about whether that their experience meets that requirement or not? Well, I think they're still gonna have to meet all the other requirements. Um, so there okay. are some things that are updated annually on the in the rest of the licensing procedure. So I think it's really about this one clause, um, and it is two, uh, yeah, section two, clause four um, that they're grandfathered in for. Yeah, I mean just to confirm that for when this came up earlier, when this piercer was applying for a license back in the summer. Um, the only thing that was holding up the license was this anatomy and physiology requirement. So all the other things had to be met, were met. It was just this. And so it, you're right. It's just this clause that we're addressing at this okay. stage. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a, did we have a second? Seconded. Okay. Um, Daya. Hi. Hi. Sorry. 
Jack? Aye. Betsy? And I also agree. And so we've grandfathered them in and we can have, did anyone have any current questions on anything else that I raised? We will have a, I, I don't like springing information on you guys and then asking you to make decisions. Um, at, in the same meeting, I'd prefer to now you sort of know what the, the outlines are, and hopefully I can send you some information to think about before we have a full discussion on it. Um, but are there any like top of mind questions, clarifications, concerns on apprenticeship, guest artist, um, social security numbers, and um, the types of piercing that we've banned? Can you say just a little bit more about the types of piercing you spoke about anatomic incorrectness? So was it language that wasn't clear or also just decisions that maybe weren't the right ones? There were deep pierce, penile piercings and deep is not a technical term. Uh, we banned the uh, piercing of vagina, uh, not vulva. Um, so it's that kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay, thank you for that. That's helpful. Yeah, um, and I, I did go back and ask Maureen about, so the um, the anatomy and physiology is in the state template, and so it seems like it's a bigger issue. The rest of these issues are things that, Mass that Amherst has put in our regulations that are not in the state regulations, um, and apparently we based ours off of East Hampton and Northampton. And so um, they might be people we should reach out to before discussing to understand um, sort of, you know, these issues around the requirements of apprenticeship. And did we just copy and paste without, maybe we missed a section <laughs> or something. Um, right. Does it work better in their scenario or um, should we look at this? And and just to, to point out our regulations seem to be about three times the size of the state regulations. So it is also possible we have a little bit uh, more than <laughs> others are requiring. <laughs> I was just looking online at the um, uh, APT, which is the um, Alliance of Professional Tattooists. And they have us. They the main thing that they emphasize is not anatomy, but um, um, teaching about safe, uh, safe body, um, about bio safety, hmm. uh, and sterilization, blood bloodborne pathogen training course. And that is already a requirement. That is a separate requirement. Um, in addition to the anatomy one. Yeah, and that looks like it's the only one that the APT has. And they used to have um, a an anatomy course, as I, if I'm, unless there's more than one professional association and it's a different one, but. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's interesting why they would have abandoned that. Hmm. And that's an online course, the bloodborne pathogen um, training. Yeah, and I think that is one of my um, questions for when we dig deeper is, is it, do we feel that this has to be an in-person course or would an online course suffice? suffice? Yeah, so the resource that you found, Daya, the Save Each Life, it is an online, it's an online test that if you take it and you pass it, then you get the certificate. But it does say call your board of health to make sure they accept this. But it's it's a great resource. It's not that expensive. You know, I, I wonder be good it to look at it. Sounds akin to that UK one. Yeah. 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 Great. And I'm, I'm, I'll look into that as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so no other questions on any of those other bits. Um Quite concerned about the social uh, number being made public record. I think that puts people in a tough spot, especially. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, I think when we talked to the inspectors, they they said they just weren't putting them on the public forum um, as a way of dealing with it. But that you know, longer term, could we take that off as a requirement unless it's adding value? Yeah. 
Agreed. And then my sense is that you're right that other boards of health are, you know, sort of not enforcing this or not really, they're just deeming it acceptable by the board and not holding people to this requirement that they do an anatomy and physiology course, which may just be fine. Um, or maybe it's, we need to be very specific about the kind of course they should take. To your point, Betsy, there are some things that would be worthwhile for people to know. But I think we definitely don't want to have something in there just for checking boxes or just because it sounds good. If it's not practical and it doesn't, not easy to meet, and it doesn't actually make people better, safer piercers, then well, let's not have it in there. So I think that's what we want to have as our goal. Yeah, the right? Save Each Life really does, the skin course really does look good. Four yeah. to seven hours online, and it requires a test afterwards, and has a what it means to pass it. Yeah, right. It seems like. Uh, sorry, one note about the biohazard safety thing. Um, as a science person, um, I think some of the things we worry about being transmitted in blood, um, are that are researched, um are trained for online um at some of the sort of forefront biomedical research institutes bloodborne pathogen training tends to be online so i i i wonder uh that's you may know more about this I, I wonder if it would be sufficient um for this case as well yeah it, it seems to me like it it should be i that seems reasonable to me Yep. Right. And I have lost. Okay. So are we happy to move on? Yeah. I, I just want to say that I'm, I, I really don't know much about, uh, I have not been in a body art studio before, so I differ heavily to the, the rest of you on this, if you have some knowledge. So I'm listening. I, I think I'm the only sure. thing I would say, <laughs> oops, go ahead, Betsy. I was going to say, I've never myself been in a body art studio, but I remember when I graduated medical school and finished my residency and I was in practice, people came in asking to, to, to have me do piercing because they didn't want to go to a body art shop. They thought that I would know better. I have had no training in that. So I, I, I think, um, I do think that there's a body of knowledge that's relevant. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I'd like to feel like uh, a, a number of teenagers and young adults get, you know, find their own tattoo studios. And I think it is a nice thing to know that that when they go to a tattoo studio, that the, the basic core of knowledge to do it safely is, is there without being, you know, ridiculously encumbering and limiting. Because uh, the, the, the thing people will do is they'll have their roommate, their friend do it. That's that's what people did in my generation. And I, I think um, ha having standards that, you know, there are some things that, that are known about how this can be done safely and, um, good that when you go into a shop that's doing it that that they've met these whatever is the basic uh, safe knowledge fund of information yeah i mean i i have some i i would have some questions but i don't think it's relevant to to the <laughs> to the to the regulations um based on my daughter's experiences with yeah i think i, I think most that. of us would not claim to be uh, experts in this area. I feel like I know a lot more about piercing than I did two months ago. Um, okay. And that's almost nothing. <laughs> but I, I appreciate everyone's, yeah, um, that's that's sort of the fun of this board is you never know. I, I know nothing about the next topic and um, which is wells. So <laughs> mm. I get to listen and learn. Um, so Kiko, do you want to set the stage for this? Um, sure. Well, <clears throat> um, if you recall, we did talk about this a little bit last time because we had two sets of wells on the agenda in October, the geothermal project, geothermal well project at Amherst College, and then a personal 
drinking water well that a family was building in their new property. And so I think we it just raised the issue. And Jack, you participated heavily in that meeting because it is your area of expertise okay. about the way things are currently, again, really looking at how are we doing things and does it make sense the way we're doing them or should we switch things up to be more efficient, to be more practical? And I think the well discussion is another one. Which, what does it, what makes the most sense in terms of which well projects should come before the board and which ones really don't need to? And I think Jack, you had some really well thought out ideas about that, that um, you began to give voice to last time and maybe you can summarize your thinking. And then I think the next step might be to have us write something up or have you, I'll be clear, have you write some up, write some rec recommendations for the board to vote on in a subsequent meeting? Yeah, I was hoping I, I could have spent some time on this um, and I didn't. I was going to email you this afternoon to let you do that. It's okay. So I don't really... Um, yeah, so the, you know, the process is, was... Uh, the well application, and then, well, I, I yeah, I, I'm even rusty on the uh, terminology because I haven't, I didn't get a chance to even open up the regs and look at it. But um, so I apologize for that. But yeah, so uh, Susan, yeah, Susan and I were discussing things. And I, I just, and I guess one opinion was like, we were looking at the siting of the well, and then uh, that came before the board, and then we would approve it or not approve it. And then the well would be uh, installed and pumping tests would be conducted, uh, water sample would be collected, and that the results of that water uh, sample and the, you know, the results of the pumping test would be uh, reviewed by the health agent and not the board. And my feeling was it it looked it seemed to me like it was backwards in terms of what would come in front of the board. Um because I felt like siting issues are are pretty pretty cut and dried that could be handled by the building commissioner or other parties, uh the planners within the town, because it's just dimensional. You know, are you that X number of feet away from a uh, underground storage tank or a septic uh, leach field, uh, property line, you know, all that stuff is what I, I can't imagine what we would say that would, we would never, uh, I think, require an additional uh, distance to any of these items, because that would be, you know, that would, <laughs> that would be taken to court sort of thing. Um, but again, Sometimes when you get these the water quality results, there you would want the expertise of the board, I would think, to look at, you know, with the number of things going on. We got PFAS now that might be a concern and, you know, just relationships to septic systems. And, you know, there's some indicator, you know, water quality uh, parameters that might suggest, you know, additional testing, you know, lots of things, uh, you know, it, it, but the good part is that only a very small part of Amherst has uh, drilled wells for water supplies. And that's up in the Flat Hills area of in the uh, Northeast portion of the town. So that's good. Um, and then like us looking at the geothermal wells seemed, uh, that didn't seem applicable for us to even be involved, but that's just, you know, that's my opinion. But I, I will look at the, the regs and kind of and have more formalized comments uh, and see if the board is interested in making any changes. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a good question to ask about the geothermal wells. Like, should do why is it how much of that? What's the health issue there that the Board of Health is looking at versus a environmental issue? I mean, I think sometimes there could be concerns about runoff and contamination of, you know, creeks and whatnot, possibly with drilling geothermal wells, but it's still sort of, it's a fine line. Is that environmental? Is it conservation commission or is it board of health? I think the way it's written now, that this is what we have to check in is what does Massachusetts general law say? Like, is yeah. it just what's on the, our plate as board of health and we need to manage it somehow? 
um, because that's what the code says we're supposed to do or you're supposed to do. Yeah, like the, the, the private well, um, our guidelines versus regulations, whereas septic systems are regulations. Got it. Uh, and they kind of dictate where, you know, wells can go. Um, that's my understanding, but I, I should, I should invest some time into this and have something, uh, and then maybe some offline discussions with you, Kiko and, and Susan before, you know, make some recommendations to the board. It's my, my feeling. Yeah. Does that sound like what you had in mind, Risha, for this agenda item? Yeah. And I, Jack, first, I, I really appreciate what you're saying. It, it, with very little knowledge and understanding of the process, it resonates with me that we would be looking at the water quality tests and that we may have uh, value to, to add on to that conversation, um, particularly in a drinking water well application. Um, the, I mean, I think the way the mandate of the, the board is right now, it is environmental and human health. Um, and so I don't think there is a different group that they would go to for the environmental. Um, so I think that is part of our mandate. And um, and I was going to ask, you know, what, how much we get to, like, if we say we don't think we need to see that, is that actually our decision to make? Or is that something larger? But yeah, like, well, I guess for the geothermal, they're talking about, you know, handling uh, the wastewater and things like that. And I guess, um, you you know, I, it should be caught by the, I, I, I don't know, I'd have to see, but I, you know, you, if there's wetlands nearby, it, like for that case, it did go in front of the Conservation Commission because they were right. concerned about impact to runoff so control that runoff right which they, which they did or they were going to they had a plan for it um but for sites where the conservation commission isn't involved um i mean i guess there are scenarios but it's just maybe there's a trigger where the um building commissioner or planning board at their discretion, bring it in front of us. I don't know. Um, I just, you know, from a health perspective, it's, it's, you know, there's noise. I think we've read where, you know, big geothermal installation, uh, UMass campus, there was no butter that, was worried about the noise issue for you know hundreds of wells that were going to be installed. I mean that comes under our purview, I guess. Um, or does it? Yeah. yeah. Well, and so there has there have been some folks that have come to the health department with concerns about that installation that's on the UMass campus. Yeah. And we're currently trying to figure out internally before I can get back to these people who come to me about this what exactly our jurisdiction is as a town and as a board of health over that UMass installation, because UMass is separate. There are many things that we do not have jurisdiction over that happen within UMass, but I'm, I'm trying to, so we're trying to piece that together. At first I thought it was crystal clear that it was not at all within our purview, and now it's seeming a little bit murkier. So I'm still trying to do the research to understand that. So this may be, because you're right, the, the primary thing that folks are concerned about are noise complaints. They worry about their foundations of their mm -hmm. homes, but the noise and the health implications of that for a project that's going to go on for a significant piece of time, like about six months. Mm -hmm. So so there'll be more to come on that too. Yep. And and Jack, I like the the line of thinking around triggers that you know if it doesn't flash any of these problem or concerns that it could be signed off on on someone who you know has the the sheet in front of them of what they're looking at um, and that if it you know and I think that's how for instance the the, the body art inspections go right the the license can be issued without involving the board at any point unless 
there is something that you know needs a waiver from us basically um but i think yeah, yeah we need to understand our purview and and how much we can choose and how much this is a mandate from um from either the state or other town bodies and then um yeah the recommendations in there but thank you for looking at that i think this will be helpful yeah, no, that, that'll be no problem. Uh, although, um, I wish I would have had more uh, to present <laughs> for today. But it's okay. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next section is director's update. So Kiko. Yeah. Um... So I guess uh, just wanted to let you know some things that we've been working on since we met last. Um, we have finished up all of our planned vaccine clinics so far. So we did a number of vaccine clinics at the public housing complex complexes in our sort of general vicinity, Chestnut Court and Whalen Clark House. Um, they weren't super well attended, but I think we did vaccinate about 40 people between those three places. The Clark House clinic was very lively and um, we worked, there's a nurse, a public health nurse who's on staff there. She's only there once a week, but she's a great partner. She was able to pre-register folks and um, it was very successful. So we do, we do these clinics in partnership with Northampton Department of Health and Human Services because they have a special grant and they're able to get a lot of vaccine that we're not able to get and to organize these clinics. So they do very well, they do a beautiful job. Um, we did two clinics here at the Bangs and they were both so well attended. We had, I think, 60 people at each one. We had a lot of young people, a lot of toddlers and screaming infants not enjoying getting their vaccines just across the hall from me here at the banks. Um, mm. So we learned a lot about how we might offer some like sensory soothing kinds of toys and distractions for young children. But it was really nice to see families coming together. Um, also really nice to see I overheard some folks, some older folks in the community who hadn't seen each other in a year and they were here at this vaccine clinic and they were so happy to know that they were all doing well and getting their shots. So it really felt like, you know, really good vibe, very community engaged, really just nice feeling and um, normalizes the idea of a community coming together to build immunity and get uh, vaccinated. So I, I, I thought it was great, felt really good this year and I hope um, we'll be able to do more. We may be able to schedule another one for December because there's some folks that everybody wants to get vaccinated before the holidays and we did offer that opportunity, but you know, schedules change. And so maybe we'll do one, squeeze one more in again with the help of Northampton sometime in December. What were the vaccines that were offered to the youngins? We were just doing COVID and flu. So just nothing, COVID. just COVID. So it was a COVID flu vaccine clinic for families. If, if young ones need vaccines for school, Olivia uh -huh. is able to offer those and she has been doing that for folks just one-on-one -on -one in her office. So yep, great. Um, she's also able to offer homebound vaccines and she's done quite a few of those, you know, to people with dementia or other conditions where they're really not getting out and about and she's able to go and give a vaccine at home. And that's been a, really appreciated by people. Do the PCPs know about that? <laughs> that that's, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't think we're advertising that to community providers in the way that we should. It's in fact, um, Maheen just realized that we don't, we, I said, this was a task I had for her. Can you see on the website if we are promoting our ability to do homebound vaccines? And it's not super clear on our website, even that we are offering the service. Right. Wow. Cause that's so, a great service. Yeah. It is a great service. And we do, again, our, we are dependent on Northampton for the vaccine, but they're very generously you know, giving us amounts. We need to track it very closely, um, but they're allowing us to do this. Because I think it's important for Amherst staff to interface with Amherst community and not have it be a Northampton nurse. I mean, they're wonderful, but you know, we want to build those relationships in our own community. So Olivia has been able to do that, which is great. Oh, that's great. And we're doing the over 65 double dosing for the, the high dose flu. Yep. Or yeah. is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah. I have a question. Um, Ika, you mentioned that we work with Northampton, which just sounds great, but I'm wondering why we aren't able to get um, sufficient quantity of vaccine. Yeah. So um, at, in the height of the pandemic, when there was this huge effort to get everybody vaccinated, every local board of health had was given a shipment of vaccine from the state for free. So they all, we, and this predates me, but I'm just, this is what I heard about how it worked. So every health department had vaccine to give to members of their community. 
Last year, the vaccine became commercialized. So that's where the move was to, to for people to go to CVS and drugstores to get, or pharmacies rather, to get their vaccines because it became a commercial venture versus free vaccine just being given away to outposts like local boards of health. So we would have to pay for it if we wanted it and we don't have it in our budget. So Northampton, because they have a grant to do regional capacity building, they have money to purchase vaccine and they, they are charged with getting folks in this greater regional area. It's 14 counties that are part of this regional collaborative. Um, and so they do vaccine clinics in all of those areas, including Amherst. And they've been really wonderful to be able to respond to our needs and be there to do clinics when we wanted them. So it's a lot yeah. of work. But it's unfortunate. It's like a shift in how we are approaching this now, you know, three years, four years post initial pandemic emergence. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so that's the clinics. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention that um, I worked with a couple of Native American organizations, including Native American Lifelines, which is based in Boston, and Okiteu, which is in Ashfield, a Native American cultural center, to do a vaccine event and health fair on the town common last Saturday. We did this for the first time last year, and they really wanted to do it again this year. And it was so wonderful this year. Um, the event is really wanting, you know, we promoted it within the Native community, which is a small community here. There are not a lot of Native folks, but there are some. And they had giveaways for um, Indigenous students who came and got a vaccine. They got a backpack and a lot of other things. But they were giving away T-shirts, really nice ones, to anybody who came for a vaccine. We were adjacent to the farmer's market. Um, they had uh, one of the Native American community leaders led a stomp dance and did some other really fun activities. So there was music and chanting and drumming. And a lot of people just kind of filtered from the farmer's market into the event. So we vaccinated 50 people that day um, we were during two hours outdoors. It was a cool, windy day, but sunny and gorgeous. And it was just felt really nice to have a town common, which is not always the most inclusive of spaces, be a place that the Native community just really took over and made their own for this vaccine event um, was really felt good. So that was fun to be part of. So that's, I think, it for vaccines. Thank you for the good questions. Um, Mosquito-borne illness, you know, we really haven't had a hard freeze yet, but we've had some nights that have been under freezing, I guess. Um, and so not, you know, the mosquito born, I mean, mosquito surveillance ended back in October. So our contract with Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District is sort of, there's no activity right now, but I'm, I'm going to meet with the director about continuing the larval treatments that we did this year. Um, you know, we didn't have any West Nile positive mosquitoes or triple E positive mosquitoes in Amherst all season. Whether that was a result of the larval treatments, I don't know, um, but it's good. Given that it was not an uneventful mosquito year, there were cases of triple E in other parts of the state. Um, so I feel like we had a good year from the mosquito standpoint here in Amherst. Um, and then the other thing I sent to everybody were the infectious disease reports that we get from um, again, Northampton puts these together for us as part of this grant that we're part of. Um, they're not terribly scintillating, but I did want to share them with you um, because they're for public release and some of the cases of these infectious diseases are so small, we don't have actual numbers. It's just less than five. You know, we don't, if it's less than five, we don't say how many because we don't want to identify anybody. Um, but I just wondered if anybody had any questions about those and if you got a chance to look at them. We do follow the TB cases. We don't have any active TB cases in the town. The, the two cases or a few cases that we have, less than five, are um, latent cases or um, they call them class B arrivals, people who've come from other countries and who are just being, who maybe have had checks x-rays that are a little bit concerning. And so they're, they're all referred for treatment. They're all being seen in the TB clinic and uh, Olivia checks in on them. So it's not very many people and no active cases for TB. So, yeah, that's TB, that. yes. TB is really surging globally, so uh, it, it wasn't great to see those numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty low. I think there have been times when we've had more than five TB cases that we're managing. Um, and so now it's not that many, but that may shift and change with um, 
more people coming into Massachusetts. Who knows what the next couple of years will bring in terms of demographic shifts and things like this. So, um, so those were the main things. Um, I did send out that update to all of you about Oriental flavor. There were a lot of developments since we all met last month. Um, and I just thought I'd put it all in an email. So you had it there. Um, it's not, the, it's an unfortunate situation. I mean, no, but everyone has been unhappy. We all wanted to work together to reopen the restaurant, but there have been ongoing issues. So I just wanted to also, before I ask if there are any questions, I wanted to say that um, I've been thinking about process improvements for us in terms of how that public hearing was handled for Mr. Zhang, the own, one of the co-owners of Oriental Flavor. I feel like once we, and I talked with Risha about this extensively, but he was not able to be, for whatever reason, with us. We didn't see his face. He was having technology issues. We couldn't hear him. Sasha had to call him from her phone. So I think we really should have found a better way to involve him, either prep him better ahead of time, make sure that he could get to a place where we could see his face, where to enable just a different kind of feeling of better communication. Um, but I did want to reassure everyone that we used a Mandarin translator in our most important meeting with them, which was an hour and a half long. So I feel confident that there wasn't a language barrier and there were really other things going on that made it very difficult for them to comply with food code and do the things that needed to be done for the inspectors to feel like it was a safe situation. And, um, and Kiko, I don't know how it works with public record. Do we need to give a summary on the record of where things stand at this point? I mean, just to um, say that it, it is not re reopened. Yeah, there's, yeah. The, I mean, the Board of Health uh, decision to uphold the inspector's recommendation still stands. The restaurant is still not open because they were not able to meet the standards. And so there isn't a decision before the Board of Health. So nothing needs to be done in this meeting. But I just thought as a courtesy, I would revisit it and give you some the information that I did in the email and in this meeting. Um, I have a comment on the second point of your email on the letter that you sent on behalf of the board, Kiko. Yeah. Um, I see that it was not uh, translated to Mandarin and because uh, in as a result of um, an additional meeting that was uh, scheduled. I'm wondering if we could post hoc uh, have that translated and sent anyway, just to sort of dot our I's and cross our T's, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I we, so we weren't able to get it translated quickly. You know, it takes, a, we don't have an expedited arrangement with our translator. That might be something that we should think about for the future, because I reached out to them right after this meeting Thursday evening. They got back to me Friday. They said it will take us a few days. That would have been Monday. And by that time, Mr. Zhang had already met with Rob, had brought a translator with him, had fully understood what was going on, was moving forward to implement the recommendations. And so that's why we didn't go ahead and translate it. And then when we had our meeting, most of the conversation was in Mandarin. So we felt like the information had been communicated clearly. So I don't know. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying just from a record standpoint, that maybe that is something that we could should do. I don't know if there's a precedent set for that or how other board members feel about the importance of having that done, even though it's very much after the fact at this point. I don't feel strongly that we would need to do it retroactively. I, I am more concerned that we set ourselves up for the future to, to anticipate yeah. Um, these kinds of things and for instance have if we know there will be a hearing or a decision that that translator has already blocked time to receive the the letter the next morning or you know exactly yeah it is. right yeah I, I think that's a great way to think about it um, process improvements going forward yeah I, I'm with the language situation, there's so many languages out there and we, you know, the town of Amherst can't be expected to cover all of them, although we fortunate to have one person uh, at our disposal that that we're, uh, they're a town employee. 
Is that correct? Uh, it's a no, no. It's a we have a contract with a. You with have a agency. contract. Yeah, we don't have oh, an in-house person. Yeah. I mean, to, for me, it seems like it's 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 incumbent on the business owner to, you know, <laughs> it's like on there and we want their, you know, we want their establishment, the facility and all that, but they just to run their business, I would think they, they would really need that capability on their side to, you know, do English. Um, yeah, I think there's a balance between being really attentive to these issues, um, but also recognizing that it is ultimately up to the business owner. You know, we we did suggest that Ning, who is one of the business owners that is bilingual, completely bilingual, come to the meeting, and she was here for part of it, but then she wasn't. Uh, I think maybe we didn't communicate clearly that the meeting started at a certain time, but their particular issue wasn't going to be heard until later. And so I don't know why she wasn't still in the meeting when the meeting when the issue came up. So I, I think, and then, you know, just doing our best in the moment to try to communicate with him and following up later. Um, but but I know there are many other businesses in Amherst where the proprietors don't speak English as a first language and we managed to work with them. So not to say that it's not important. I think we need to do our best. And then there is a certain amount of responsibility that business owners need to take to be able to participate in the conversation. And when we sent the letter out, we always send it out with, an additional piece of paper that says, you know, in various languages, please have this translated. It's important. You know, like if you get something in the mail about your electric bill or whatnot, it has that a supplemental piece of paper that says this is important. Have it translated in thirty different languages. So again, you do what you can to try to facilitate people getting the information that they need. But so I think we could have done some things better. And I also feel confident that there were many other issues at stake that didn't have to do with language barrier that led us to this outcome where we are right now. Yeah, that, that, that was that was that was uh, not painful, but it was unfortunate to see that. So I'm glad you you know I mean, we all felt bad that yeah. that went that way, but yeah, yeah, so. We don't like closing restaurants. It's not something that anybody wants to do, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, okay, two more things. Um, just quickly, I wanted to share that we um, have partnered with East Hampton and Northampton to apply for a um, opioid settlement matching grant. So we use we are going to contribute fifty thousand dollars of the money that we have. We have about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars right now in the coffers with more coming in in small amounts every year from various settlements. Um, we are we have begun to spend some of it. We're doing some harm reduction work with Craig Stores, the shelter, um, providing them with a contract for to purchase a lot of supplies and do some trainings with staff around harm reduction and Narcan use, sharks disposal, things like that. Um, but with this $50,000 that we're pooling, this grant opportunity will match it 100%. So there will be $300,000 if we get this grant to use to do expanding harm reduction efforts um, using tapestry. It's actually tapestry that is applying for the grant with this money that's been donated through these three municipalities to do regional work in those 14 counties that I mentioned earlier that are part of the public health excellence grant that Northampton leads. So I think it, it's a it's a very low barrier grant that has good um, chances of being funded and it will allow us to do a lot more harm reduction work, especially in those communities that are very remote and where there is hard for people to access treatment, transportation is a barrier, um, lots of different things. So this is could be a real step forward in terms of our collaborative efforts as a town to do work here in Amherst, but also in the surrounding region to you know affect address the opioid crisis. So we'll hear about that hopefully in a month or so. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to say, which hopefully you will hope this doesn't <laughs> scuttle our plans or make you hate me, but there is a tobacco control update for local public health. <laughs> that's a workshop for Franklin and Hampshire County boards of health that is happening on Thursday, October, December 12th. Um, and it's uh, local boards of health are invited to learn about emerging tobacco nicotine trends that are a threat to public health, board of health responsibilities and tobacco control, what work is being done in Franklin and Hampshire County to enforce tobacco control laws and what supports are available to your board of health. So I just found out about this this week. And my first thought was, uh oh, 
if we were to attend this, would we be re-revising our tobacco regulations and should, you know, with any of this information? Like, what if we had the public hearing in December, finalized everything, and then we went to this and, because I plan to go, and discovered that there are even more things that we might wanted to have put in those regulations. So, I'm sorry to introduce this at the end. Now I'm feeling like maybe there's a different decision that needs to be made, but I just wanted you to be aware. It doesn't have to change what we're doing, but um, it could potentially be a source of more information that would question whether we have the most up-to-date tobacco regulations drafted. Just posing that question to the board. I, I mean, I assume it's being done by the same people we've been talking to this whole time. Yes, it ha it is primarily, yeah. Um, yes, not Cheryl Sabara, but Sarah McColgan, who works closely with her, and Meredith, who we've talked with before, um, and Heather Warner, who is with the Hampshire Franklin Tobacco Free Community Partnership. So it's mostly the same folks. Um, I don't know if there's anything brand, brand new that's come through in the last month or two that would affect things. Maybe not. Um, but I just felt, and so maybe it's a moot point, but I just felt compelled to bring it up, uh, at least for people to attend, even if it doesn't have a bearing on what we've done or are planning to do in the future. Yeah, so I assume you'll you'll email that around to all I of will. us. I will, yeah. Um, and, and I mean, I'm not, my my sense is not to panic. Um, I think we, we continue with the plan and if something has happened, I mean, it would be really unfortunate that if there was some big new information or you know the the lawsuits went one way that we wouldn't have heard about it between then and now um but i i would assume that you know our conversations with them would have given us the the high level information that that they have so yeah and I think that we're much farther along than some municipalities are in terms of having revisited our tobacco regulations, thinking through it a lot as a board. You know, other people, other places may not have had the ability to do the work that you all have done. And so this workshop may be, you know, telling them things that you're right. We already know, but they haven't heard yet. So. I mean, we we had a lot of conversations. <laughs> we, we absolutely did. Um, so maybe so anyway, I will send this on to everyone. It's in the evening. Um, and it's an online session, so, and it won't conflict now with our board meeting. That was the other thing I was thinking, because it's on Thursday, December 12th, but if we're meeting on the 5th, then this doesn't conflict, conflict, so. Sounds good. That's it for me. So the next item on agenda is topics not previously anticipated. Anyone have any topic they wanted to raise that wasn't on the agenda? I mean, we've got 10 whole minutes before we're supposed <laughs> to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's there have been no attendees, so nobody has, has come in trying to engage. Um, so great. It's really nice to, to have you all on um, for some of our newer members and maybe next month we can get a full board. Uh, I don't think we've had one yet since all of our new members have joined, so. Yeah, so then our next meeting is December 5th and we will hold a public hearing about the tobacco regulations before the meeting, correct? Yeah, but if that is enough time to put out yeah. a public comment. Yeah, so I think it would be at five, you know, I, I can check with Premila and see because I know there was a interest in having it earlier, but um, that might not work for her. So we'll keep it. I'll keep I'll confirm and you know, let everyone know via email. Great. Uh, I, I'm sure I have to say official words about adjourning, but. I think you have to ask for a motion to adjourn. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> motion to adjourn. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Yeah. Seconded. Do, do we all have to agree? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It was great seeing you all. Bye-bye. Thank you so Bye. much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye.